Romans chapter 3. Let's start there. First of all, uh, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So when a person is saved or a person who is enjoying the benefits of salvation, they are enjoying that because of the, of the grafted in word of God or the sown word of God. The word of God, the Bible is going into their soul and it is making a difference. It is recreating them. I want you to consider just for a minute the idea of your physical body. Your physical body it has all the members on it and those members are in a constant state as some cells die off. Your body is in the process of manufacturing brand new cells. This has been going on since the day that you were conceived. Now, what is it that pilots that ship? What is it that regulates and continues the process of life in your body? It's your DNA. Everything that you are, everything that you possess, every part of your body, right down to the chemicals, all the proteins, things that we cannot even see with our eyes that are part of our body, are all manufactured by the DNA. The DNA rules the mechanisms of your body. If those mechanisms are wrong, it's because there's something wrong in the DNA. But if that DNA is right, then every part of your body is going to be, is in a constant state of building, growing, maturing, bringing forth fruit, recreation. Some, like I said, some cells die off, but then there's new cells that are created to replace that. And so everything boils down to this amazing book that God wrote called DNA. Amen? That's how, and that's how God does it in His church. That's how God does this thing. So when we are bringing people to Jesus, it must be with the seed of the Word of God. If it's not that, then I don't see how it can be salvation. I don't see how it can be. So, let's look at, we all know Romans 3.23, for uh, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But let's go back now a little bit and let's walk, let's go, let's say, oh, we're in Romans 3, um, verse 19. Let's start there. Now, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So now you can see now, just a few verses before Romans 3.23, why Paul said what he said, when he said, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam one law, therefore one sin could be committed. Now by the time of Moses and the giving of the Ten Commandments, now he has multiplied his commandments Therefore, he has multiplied the probability of mankind becoming a sinner or being born into sin. And then it is, it could be said that once you're born, it is an automatic thing that you are going to break the law of God. And God instituted it that way because he has as, as man's savior, his son, Jesus Christ. And he wants the world to bow before the cross of Christ and give Christ all the praise and all the glory for their salvation. So what God did was, and he tells us this, if you want to do a study of this, study Romans 5. Because God multiplies sins so that sin becomes exceedingly sinful. So let's say, um, who in here really does not like apples? Is there anybody here that does not like eating apples? All right. Is there anybody here who does not like eating mushrooms? I knew I'd get you on that one. <laughs> Sterling calls them stump rot. I love them. So let's say that the fruit in the Garden of Eden of the knowledge of good and evil was a mushroom. Well, if Sterling came along, if he was Adam, 
And Eve said, you want a mushroom? Sterling would go, ooh, get that stump right away from me. I ain't eating that. But really, that wasn't God's plan. So just because somebody doesn't like mushrooms, does that mean then somebody can be born and then not ever be tempted by sin? So what God did was he laid down in this world enough things so that everybody, everybody is going to end up being guilty before God. That's what that says. If you look at that verse again, verse 19 it, halfway through the verse that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That idea of every, every mouth being stopped. Everybody's got this plan, Jeff, that well, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell God all the good things that I did and all the good deeds that I did. And God's going to say, shut your mouth. Close it. Because your wickedness was so great. Whatever righteousness you think you had doesn't exist. That's why he did what he did. So that it includes then, as far as humans on this planet, every single one is guilty before God. And there are no exceptions with one exception. Jesus Christ. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, speed limit signs. Or uh, road signs of various kinds. Or um, we just know by way of, you know, in school they teach us certain of the laws of the Constitution of the United States. Certain of the laws of the Constitution of the state of Missouri. We learn those laws and those are the laws that we all live by. And, the, and what this is saying is, is that it is not possible in any way, in any shape, in any denomination, in any ism, like Hebrew roots ism or Seventh Day Adventism or any of those things. It is not possible to be justified in the eyes of God by keeping the law because no one keeps the law. No one does. The book of James tells us that if a man offends the law at one point, he is guilty of all. He's, you haven't just violated one little fraction of the law. You have broken how, this is how God sees it. You have broken the law. And for that, there must be a punishment. So, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the, the law told us what we have to do and what we should not do. But those are the things that we did or those are the things that we did not do. We broke the law and no one is excused from that. So verse 21. But now. So he lays out this idea that everybody's guilty. Verse 21 says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Did Moses ever teach anything about the salvation by grace through faith? A substitutionary atonement. Yes. Moses taught substitutionary atonement in the law. How so? By them bringing little lambs and goats and oxen and rams in to be sacrificed for the sins of the people rather than the people suffering the consequences of death. So Moses speaks of it. Noah speaks of it. Adam taught, we, when we see Adam, we see that God clothed Adam. That is God's righteousness imputed to him without Adam's works. And so every place in the Old Testament, you can see the doctrine of the grace of God and the righteousness of God imputed to man without man doing the works of the law. I've brought up these, these people. Think about these patriarchs in the Bible. Those people that we call the holy saints. And yet the Bible gives us enough detail of their life that we know that they're not all that great. Abraham, Abraham was a liar. On two different occasions, Abraham deceived the king of the land because he was afraid that king, one of them was the king of Egypt. He was afraid that that king would steal his wife. So he told those kings that that was his sister, not his wife. And the king said, oh, great, it's his sister. I'm going to take her. 
And then come to find out it's Abraham's wife and the king got angry and said, why did you lie to me? Why did you tell me that thing? If, if I would have known she was your wife, I would have never touched her. I would have never put eyes on her. So we know Abraham was the liar. We know that Sarah didn't really quite believe what God said when he said, from this time next year, you're going to have a baby. She laughed and then she lied about it. So we had this evidence in the Bible that these patriarchs who are in heaven now, we're accompanied by a great cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12 says. We know that they are not in heaven by their righteousness. They're in heaven by grace without the works of the law. So verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. And notice there's a colon there. The, the, the idea is not finished. In fact, this whole sentence starts in verse 21. The whole sentence, in fact, it doesn't end until verse 26. This sentence goes from 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and verse 20. That's a long sentence. How'd you like to diagram that, JR? You do sentence diagramming yet? You put, you draw a line, you put the noun here and a little slant line, put the verb there. How would you like to diagram this one passage right here from verse 21 to verse 26? There's colons, semicolons, commas. It's crazy. But see, all that has to be, I think all that is best understood packaged together. So the righteousness of God, verse 22, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely. So what does it cost? Nothing. By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Again, this is about Jesus. It's about how Jesus is perfectly righteous and not one other human being is even righteous. We're not righteous. So God made enough laws so that everybody breaks the law. Brother Sterling, that's what we've got going on in this country. There are so many laws that get passed by state legislatures, by the, the federal government, that it literally, it makes every American citizen in some form or fashion a criminal. Whether misdemeanor or felon, it makes everybody a breaker of the law. Everybody. And that's what God did. And he did that so that we could be debased and Christ could be exalted. Amen? Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word for is basically a... It's showing you that what he's saying is based upon what he has said previous to that. So let's go to, oh, let's see here. Let's go then, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And remember... What does it take to obey the gospel? What is obedience to the gospel? The Bible actually points this out to you. Isaiah 53 is that great passage in the, in the Old Testament that prophesies all the things that was going to happen to Jesus on the cross. And, you know, and it starts out with, who hath believed our report? And Paul said, obedience to the gospel is Isaiah 53, 1, who hath believed our report? When you obey something, you submit to it. You bow before it. You kneel before it. You say that that is what is in effect over my life. Do you believe the report that what happened to Jesus satisfied the just demands of a holy God? 
Okay, because that's what I, that's how the Ethiopian eunuch was led to Christ, was by Isaiah 53. So, in verse, uh, let's see, where were we? Verse 16, uh, verse 17, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You believed it where? From where? Your heart. Your mind didn't make that decision. Your heart did. And I've got a, oh man, powerful, powerful teaching on the heart, the human heart. And Jeff, why all these people are being deceived by the internet? It's because they have idols in their heart already. And God knows it. And God allows them to be deceived based upon the idols, the stumbling block of their iniquity. He says it in Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel, yeah, Ezekiel 16, four, Ezekiel 14. I get it right. Ezekiel 14 is where they, the, these guys from, from Jerusalem come to Ezekiel and say, Won't you, will, you, will you inquire in God for us and tell us what God said? And God said, Ezekiel, I know their hearts. They're full of idols. And they got stumbling blocks of their own sin, their own iniquity. So I'm going to answer them according to their own wickedness. They don't want to know the truth. I'm not going to let them have the truth. I'm going to let them believe lies. And people believe lies. And when you believe a lie, you cannot choose from your heart to serve Jesus Christ. Cannot, you will not make that decision right. So, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So, the question of once we're saved, are we supposed to live right? It's not a supposed to. It's a will. You will. You will, you'll have the desire and throughout, however God leaves you down here on this earth, He's going to purge. He's going to purge you. He's going to take things out of your life. It may not happen all at once. I'm patient. God's patient. God along, God's long suffered with every one of us, church members. Amen. Okay. But that's the, that's the outcome. So verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity... Even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. So, if a person says, oh, I'm saved, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the cross, um, but me and my girlfriend, or me and my boyfriend, and you can put that however you want, we love each other, we're not married, but it's okay. And we're going to stay that way. That's not salvation. And again, I'm not saying... You have to. What I'm saying is, that's what you'll want. We strive every day in our life. We are struggling against the will of our flesh. And we learn through the process of time and God's correction in our life, we learn to not give in to what the flesh demands all the time. That's why we go through what we go through sometimes. God's te He's training us. And it's our desire. We don't want to do that stuff anymore. Who wants to go back to that? Okay. Uh, verse 20. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto what? Holiness and the end, everlasting life. So when a person's saved, it's not that they have to do good things. It's that that shows up. That's what shows up. Is a new nature and a new desire. And it's you saying, God, I don't want to do this anymore. God, I don't want to be part of this anymore. God, I want out of this. God, I want to be forgiven of this. I want to be free from this. 
And God is taking you down that road. And that's how you know you're saved. And so it's you are bearing the fruit of holiness. And then you're going to get everlasting life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3, 16. Let's go there. Because he mentioned the gift of God. So let's look at what the gift is. The Bible defines it all. John 3. We all know verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But let's back up. Let's get a little, let's get a little background here. Let's walk circumspectly. Let's look around that verse to see what, what, why Jesus said that. Did he just like pop off and say that one thing? No, he said things before and after that. He says, let's go back to, um, oh, let's see here. He's, he's telling uh, Nicodemus. It uh, and you know, or the beginning of the chapter about being born again. So he says in verse seven, "Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again." Um, and Nicodemus wants to know, you know, how can these things be? Jesus in verse ten answered and said unto him, "Art thou a master of Israel? And knoweth not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, and verily means truly. It's verified. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak." that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man that ascendeth up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. And verse 14 now, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And in this, we get this idea of what crucifixion is all about. God didn't, he didn't, he didn't ordain that Jesus be walking down the road and an arrow hit him in the heart and kill him and that was God's sacrifice. He didn't ordain that Jesus got beat up so bad by his accusers that he died from his wounds. That wasn't God's plan. His plan is that he's lifted up. So here is Jesus. And we just get this idea of the cross where Jesus literally is between heaven and earth. He's lifted up so that everybody around and he's on a, is he in a valley? He's on a hill. He's on the hill of Golgotha, Calvary. He's lifted up so that everybody can see him. And he says, as Moses did that. And what was the thing with Moses? Moses, everybody was uh, complaining against God, murmuring. And their heart wasn't right. And so God allowed, he sent in these fiery serpents. We know, we know those are devils. We know that the venom of their mouth symbolically is like the poison that's all around us. John, I know a little bit about your testimony Christianity, Bible believing, was not your first stop. That's not the first wind that blew you around. But it's where you ended. Praise God. Okay? So what happened was the serpent's poison that came out of the mouth of people poisoned your mind. And you didn't believe the Bible. You hated it. Right? I'm just guessing, but... Okay, And you decided you didn't want to die that way. At one day, you woke up and said, I do not want to die in this condition. So God gave Moses a remedy. Moses make a brass serpent, put it on a brass pole, raise it up so that everybody can see it. Put it in a place where everybody can see it. And if they get bitten by those serpents... If they will look on that, I'll heal them of the venom. Then they'll live. Sounds crazy, right? That was God's plan. And it's the idea that, and, and I asked the question, did Moses teach the doctrine of grace through faith? 
Yes. Because Moses said, see that serpent? Look on it. If you look at it, if you've been bitten, you'll be healed. Instantaneously, they were healed. And they lived. And it was God teaching the doctrine of faith. Trust what I say. Even though it doesn't, you can't rational, rationalize it out. Trust what I say. So, uh, Jesus then, and I looked at this years ago and I said, is Jesus Satan? I mean, what, what's going on here? But in the language of typology, we know doctrinally that Christ became sin. He took on the form of the enemies that were against us. As Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And again, it's just like Moses. Look at the cross and you'll live. And now believe. The only way that we can look at the cross is through the eyes of the scriptures. That's the only way. Looking at that cross does not save you. If that were true, I'd take a picture of this everywhere and say, see this? Okay, you're saved now. Thanks. Live your life. Go do what you want. But that's not it. Through the, through the eyes of the scripture, we see the cross and you choose to believe it or you choose to not believe it. And a lot of people don't believe it and they won't believe it. And yet God said, that's my salvation. That's how I'm choosing to save you. I gave my only begotten son to die in your place. So that's why he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 comes after, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His first coming, he's coming to offer eternal life. But his second coming, he's coming to judge. The day of salvation is today. Now, Ephesians 2. Turn there. Ephesians 2. Charge. Ephesians 2. This is what I uh, shared with the pastor brother that spoke with me. There, believe it or not, uh, John was telling me, and I won't say the whole scenario, of a particular church in our county. Where he knows for a fact there is a a teen, teen Sunday school class teacher that's a drunkard. Smoker, drinker, the whole thing. And this church, and you'd be surprised if I gave you the name, this church allows this man to teach the teenagers. Ain't right. But... They had this idea, see, that if you pray a prayer at one point in your life, whatever you do after that doesn't matter. You still get to go to heaven. So, and that's taken to such a point as to people then do whatever they want to do because they were told that they're still going to heaven. But what does the Bible say? In Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go to, oh, let's go to verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. That's the first time he says it in this passage. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. 
So, we had Romans 6 that told us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We went back to John 3, 16, found out that if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, then we can believe under righteousness. That is the gift of God, the love of God manifested by that gift. It's offered to the whole world, even though the whole world's not going to accept it. It's still there. Anybody can. So then, that takes us then to Ephesians 2. Uh, um, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. So God saves us by His grace, which is unmerited, and our faith, which is we believe God's Word. Then he says, verse 9, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'll say this again. Every religion and every belief where there is a work that supposedly generates a blessing from heaven, there is always boasting of that work. Or there's always uh, putting people up on a pedestal who have achieved spiritual things that nobody else can achieve. That must mean that they are more special to God or the gods than anybody else. This is, this is very true in India. In India, if you're some, if you're born, if you're born with some bizarre birth defect that closely resembles one of their 330 million gods, then you are a sign from these gods and you're a holy person and everybody reveres you. They think you're, you're a sign from the gods and they'll, I mean, you'll be, you'll be wealthy for the rest of your life. People just give money to you because you're something big thing. What I'm saying is wherever there is a idea that a work brings down God's blessing on you because you did it, they're always boast about it. Always. What can you and I boast of? Not a thing. So not of works lest any man should boast. Now, so people stop there. Say, see, it's by grace. It's by grace. It's all grace. I was made aware of a doctrine now that's actually taken over somebody that I know in the ministry. They call it, it's called by different names. One of the names is called extreme grace. And it basically says, if you say you're saved, you're saved. And you can even have an affair and cheat on your wife. Don't worry about it. God's grace will still cover that no matter what. No, not even, even if you're not sorry for it. You can drink alcohol. If I told you the name of the man that I know that's fallen into this, you'd know the name. Maybe. So, <laughs> anyway, it's called extreme grace. And it basically says you can do whatever you want to, still be saved, and everything's okay. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that. Because, verse 10, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Good works. Uh, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, the Bible doesn't just stop with grace. It says that if God saved you, then God has a plan of good works laid out for your life that through time, as, as whatever time God allows you here on this earth, God is going to ordain you unto those good works. So, is it right to live right in Jesus? Is it right to not sin? Is it good to follow the law if we can follow the law? Is it good to do that? Even Paul said in Romans 7, he said, every time I break the law, I consent that the law is good. So how can we think that we can be saved and there is no expectation from God or man that we can do evil works and call that salvation? It's not. 
when we are, we are recreated. We're made new, just like the new heaven and new earth. In the new heaven and the new earth, what is there that's not in the new heaven? The old. That's good. That covers it all. Death, tears, pain, sin, whoremongers, sorcerers, dogs. Those things are not allowed in the new Jerusalem. Not allowed. So, and I know, listen, God's patient. I, I love people. God is so patient with me. He's long suffering with me. I ain't got it all right. But I want it all right. It's, it's, you know, it's good that we repent of our sins. It's better if we don't have to. That's grace by, our, by grace are you saved through faith. Yes. But then we are ordained to live a holy life. And to be separated out. I didn't want to live the way the rest of the world lives. I don't want that. So you choose righteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Did we cover them all? 1 John 1, 9. Let's see, Romans. Oh, we, we didn't get uh, he, Romans 10. Let me do that real quick. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because Romans 10 requires openness. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Well, what are you ashamed of? Rose, bless your heart. Rose had her little birthday party. Her daughter put it on for her. And there's one thing that Rose's family knows about Rose. And she's a Christian. She's a Christian woman. And if you're going to have a get-together where everybody's going to drink and take drugs and sleep around with one another, she's not going to be part of it. They know that about her. That's her testimony. Okay? They know because she's, she's told various of her family members, you need to get saved. You need to get right with God. She said that to them. What I'm saying is, when you're saved, if you're really saved, you don't hide it. Now, I'm not saying get in everybody's face and blast them about how righteous you are and how wicked they are you don't do that i've had people do that to me you don't do that romans 10 let's go to verse um five for moses described the righteousness which is of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise in other words he, it speaks this way Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. In other words, there isn't somebody that has to go up to heaven to get salvation. There isn't somebody that has to go down into hell to um, set captivity free. That's already been done for us. It's already here and available. So he says, um, verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. If you're in court, who, who in here is, I won't ask you who'd ever been in court. If you've ever been in court, John, if, the, if somebody asks you a question in court, can you nod your head or give a hand gesture to signify your answer. Yet why? They want it on record. A nod doesn't work. You have to say it. 
And the shame of it is, uh, this guy that kidnapped that teenage girl, killed her parents and kidnapped her, he's now remorseful. And he has sent a letter out telling the family that he regrets doing that and that he is not going to make this girl spell out exactly what he did to her. He's going to spare her that and he is going to confess to everything that he did. And the sad of it is, in courts nowadays, if something was done to you, you have to say in complete language everything that is done to you. But it has to be testified of. And this is Christianity. We don't, there are no closet secret Christians. So he says in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. You, you believe it in your heart, but then you must confess it with your mouth. And I will be blasted for this, believe it or not, Sterling. There are knuckleheads on YouTube that when I preach this, they go off on me. That's not the gospel. You're preaching works. Really? I said, God, forgive me. What work is that? To me, work is with a hammer or a shovel or a pickaxe or something. That's work. Not talking, okay? But anyway, for, for it's the mouth, the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be what? Shamed. Gloria, if you believe Jesus, you're going to tell people you believe in Jesus. Even if your family says, I don't believe in Christianity, I think that's nuts. You're going to say to your family, Jesus is the only way to salvation. You're not going to hide it from people. So, verse uh, 12 then, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So, so you do have to believe. You can't just say, I believe Jesus, the son of God, and I want to be saved to be a Christian so I can go to heaven. There, I said the words. The Catholic church might allow that. God doesn't. And who, who knows the heart of man? Only God does. Now, 1 John. Then we'll dismiss. 1 John 1. 1 John 1, 9 is, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But, let's look at that context. First of all, and I'm not going to do the whole chapter, but verse 1 of 1 John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. I like that verse. That is one of my favorite verses that proves to me that what I'm holding in my hand is the actual word of God. That doctrine, that idea has now become so... Um, to many people, erroneous. They say that we are in error for believing that the Word of God is in the Bible. Are you crazy? Are you nuts? It's always been that the Word of God is written down for us to have. Always been that way. Well, I believe in the living Word of God. I believe in Jesus. The devils also believe in tremble. So you're saying you don't believe everything in the Bible. No, I don't believe everything in the Bible. But my hands have handled the word of life. How can you reconcile that? That's what John said. And that goes to 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And the word of God can be handled with our hands. Even if you have a phone doing it. Amen? So, now look at verse... Um, Verse 5, or verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all, all sin. 
Not the Catholic version of it where it says Christ takes away most sin, but you must pay for some of it by doing good deeds, by doing penance, by saying multitudes of repetitive prayers. That is not Bible doctrine. That's not what God said. Verse 8, if we say, here it is right here. This is why, this is why verse 9 is so important. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if you say that you haven't sinned or what you did wasn't that bad or what you're doing is not a sin, even though God says it is a sin, if you say that you walk in darkness, you are not saved. You can confess the rest of your sins and die and go to hell. By not acknowledging when God, and I'm not talking, you know, some way out there thing. I'm talking about thou shalt not commit adultery. We know what adultery is. Thou shalt not lie. We know what a lie is. Thou shalt not steal. We know what stealing is. These are simple things. If God said don't do them and we do them, then they're a sin. And we must acknowledge that they are a sin. If we say that we had no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if the truth is not in us, then we walk in darkness. And if we walk in darkness, then we're not in the light. If we're not in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ does not forgive us of all of our sins. So then, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, afterward, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. How do you make God a liar? By arguing with him. God, I don't care what the Bible says, I feel that what I'm doing is right. God, I don't care what the Bible says, this, this woman I'm shacking up with, she must, so I've had people, I had a guy tell me that. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do what I want to. If you say you have no sin, you're telling God that he's a liar. If God said it's wrong and you're doing it, confess it. It's easy. Confess it. Get it, get it out. Get it out. Get, be a godly person and confess your sins. That's what godly people do. But to be a reprobate, all it takes is for you to do something that God says clearly is wrong and yet you justify it and do it and say it's not a sin the way i'm doing it is not a sin then god is a liar and you're in darkness and the blood of jesus christ does not cover you so you see how the context works yes i believe give these people these verses give them these simple plain gospel but afterward give them give them the whole of it give them a bite of your sandwich if they like it give them the rest of the sandwich amen but don't just give them a bite and say, that's good enough for you. That's all you need. That's not Christianity. That's not our life. That's not what God called us to do. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We will be here Wednesday night. We will have church this Wednesday night. We will be here. Who's messed up from losing that hour of sleep? I'm not. I'm good. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Poor, poor hope. Now it's not really bothering me. And Tammy, it's good to have you because it's still daylight outside. Amen. Pam, you're a blessing. You're an answer to prayer because we've been praying for you that you get back on your feet. We love you. Uh, pray for Sister Linda Toomey. She said that because of the flu... She has to go to rehab. It's made her legs almost useless. She's not, she can't walk right now. It's, it just hurt her that bad. So for, for about two weeks, she's got to be in rehab. So pray and lift her up. Sister Betty uh, Walsh is uh, probably going to get out of the hospital tomorrow as soon as the cardiologist signs off on it. But she, apparently she's feeling well and praise the Lord for that. I love this church. I love you people, and uh, you pray for me, all right? I want to keep going. I, wanna, I don't want to quit. I don't want to give up. I don't want to get discouraged. So pray for us. Pray for our work, our labor, our ministry. Pray for our family. Pray for our, you folks online. Pray for us. We'll pray for you, all right? Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus. Jesus is the reason why we're here, the only reason why we're here. He gets all the praise and all the glory. Father, I love salvation. 
I love talking about the gospel. I love explaining how your substitutionary atonement works. I love it, God. And Father, I don't know who, why you laid this on my heart or who needed it. But I hope, God, that it's a blessing. I hope, Father, that somebody needed it because of the lies and the false doctrine that's out there. Father, bless our church and use us for your glory, your kingdom. That's what we care about first. We love you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.